Uh, David, David Bell, you're up. Uh, am I uh, unmuted? Yeah. Okay, well, th thanks very much. I was very moved in the, um, um, the second of the readings by the difference between those who'd fought in the resistance and those who were still uh, in the other country. The resistance having a much more, inter na seem being disposed because of their conditions to a much more, much less nationalist view. As I understood it, Owen was pretty clear. She, she said, I think around the time of the Eichmann trial, this is not a Jewish problem and it's not a German problem. It's a human problem. Um, and I think the distinctions that she's making here, to me, they're like, they're like moments of human possibility where people, because of the conditions that they're in, think differently. And my own example of that is, I went to work in Mozambique in 1976, just after the end of the colonial period, and there was a new uh, government. And there were a lot of Portuguese soldiers in Mozambique who'd been extremely savage and they were impounded in a camp in the north of the country. And the then president, Samora Machel, went up to the camp to speak to the Mozambicans and the Portuguese soldiers. And what he said to them was, you have more in common with these people in the camp than you think. These are workers and peasants sent by the corrupt government of Portugal here. They had no choice. They didn't understand what they were doing. And you have much more in common with them than they have with the people who sent them. And they will not, none of them are to be harmed. That is the way we will show the, our understanding. And they weren't, and they were uh, sent, sent back. There was no capital punishment at that time in Mozambique. But it seemed to me that the, the, these moments occur when a completely new way of thinking it goes away again. In Mozambique, it was capital punishment did return. But the, these, and it's very interesting to think of the conditions that can make people transcend these primitive um, categories. I thought people might be interested to, I don't know if any people have read East West Street by Philip Sands. Um, one aspect of that book is tracing the history, partly a memoir. He's a famous uh, international lawyer and professor of uh, of, um, of law at the UCL in London. But it's tracing his own family history, but it's also tracing the legal process behind the Nuremberg trials. But in particular, the history of the concept of genocide and the concept of crimes against humanity. Uh, genocide was, um, the term was invented by Lemkin and crimes against humanity by Lovecraft. But it's very, very interesting, the tension between these two different concepts. And I suspect, that event would have come down on crimes against humanity. But part of Lautrach's reason for maintaining that was that once you say it's genocide, then you have to define what genocide is. And there'll be com group competitive claims for the label. Whereas the basic thing is, is the crime against humanity. And it was a fantastic book. And it's called East West Street. The last thing I wanted to say is that, do you think that there might be a connection or am I forcing the issue between this idea of the vacuum, nihilism, and, tyrannic, and tyrannies, and tyrannical, excited tyrannies? Do you think there might be a connection to the letter? That is, it, it seems to me that many movements that start off as liberal and emancipatory, because of the world in which they now found themselves, which I haven't sort of worked out, twist and turn and become new forms of tyranny where they oppose freedom of speech and illiberal. And I just think there might be some connection between a kind of nihilism that that's replacing with this kind of heated, passionate hatred of opposing thought. I mean, I don't want to go into it, but it's something that I'm deeply engaged in as a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist at the Tavistock because of the uh, old gender issues and um, you know, children being pushed forward for surgery to their bodies and so on, which I've been very concerned about. But the, 
silencing of speech is just extraordinary. But I think it might be related to the vacuum. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there, uh, David. And uh, I mean, yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, I think uh, at the end, you, you raise some, some somewhat um, important but explosive issues. So um, uh, we'll see where that takes us. Uh, you know, a couple points uh, on the crimes against humanity versus genocide. Um, you know, RN, uh, uh, you know, is, as you say, you know, more interested in crimes against humanity. But I think it's important to understand that at the very center of her definition of a crime against humanity is a crime against plurality, because plurality is part of the human condition. And uh, the essence of a crime against humanity is thus a crime, is thus the, the effort to eradicate a particular people or group of people from the earth, which is what she understands genocide to be. Um, uh, uh, simply killing Jews is not genocide or a crime against humanity. Killing a group of Jews is not. Um, but a systematic bureaucratic effort to eliminate Jews as a people from the earth is uh, what she means by a crime against humanity. And, um, and, and, and that, because it's a crime against plurality. And, and so there's a connection between genocide and, and crime against humanity in, in, her, in her work. Um, what do I want to say about your last point about the vacuum? Um, yeah, I, you know, again, I've been criticized in the last, well, many times, but certainly in the last two days, um, because in the letter that, you know, I, I signed, uh, there's a kind of, in some people's minds, both sides, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, and I, and I actually was, somewhat involved in making sure that the letter included this aspect. So I, I guess I take some responsibility for it, which is to say that to me, the problem we're facing today is a problem of illiberalism. Uh, and we see that problem with the rise of the right, the populist right. Um, now, I mean, you know, people talk about cancel culture and criticize the left on it. I mean, and, and, I, and I, I do too, so I'm, I'm with them. But I mean, to me, the most successful example of cancel culture right now is, is the President of the United States, who whenever somebody um, uh, says anything he doesn't like or does anything he doesn't like, he cancels them on Twitter. Um, I mean, what happened to Lieutenant Colonel Vindman this week, uh, a, a, a hero and a patriot, uh, who's basically been forced to resign from uh, the army uh, because he's been canceled by the president uh, and anyone who would support him uh, will be fired. Um, you know, not to mention all the other politicians that he's canceled uh, and, and keeps in line. So, uh, you know, I think you see it on, on I, I do think you see it on, on both sides. Um, and everyone wants to ask me which side is worse. <laughs> and, you know, um, I think there's arguments for, for both. Uh, you know, right now, I think uh, right-wing populism is in power and therefore, because it controls the state around the world, not just the United States, quite dangerous. But, you know, whether in Venezuela or other places, left-wing uh, populism is quite dangerous. Um, and I do think there's an argument to be made that, you know, even in the United States, a lot of the most powerful cultural institutions, academic institutions, corporate institutions are controlled by a kind of, of left-wing populism. And that makes it quite dangerous. You know, I, I am not interested in, you know, picking sides. And I guess that's why some people criticize me. Um, I'm interested in trying to understand and analyze um, uh, the, the fundamental um, uh, ways that both these appeals to an illiberal, uh, intolerant, illiberal uh, culture uh, are, are, are founded upon what I take to be um, a common uh, psychological 
uh, craving um, for uh, certainty and meaning uh, throughout society. Um, that's the kind of, um, you know, analysis that I do as um, a thinker. Uh, obviously, I then am a political person as a citizen, and I can take my sides. And you know, but to me, that's my business. And uh, and as an academic, uh, I, I I can I can sometimes let that into the world. But I'm I don't think I have any expertise on that. That's just my prejudice, uh, and I have prejudices. But um, uh, but that's where I'm trying to to understand. I don't know if that that helps, but uh, but that's how. Um, I've come to see it. Um, I I'm, I'm David, if you want to respond, I'm happy. To, I don't want to get into a huge argument about politics here, uh, but if you want to respond to the uh, intellectual side to that, um, I'm happy to have you do so. Uh, you're muted, though. Um, yeah. Oh, there you are. I think there may be something that's kind of independent of right or left a kind of growth of something within our culture that can adhere to a right-wing movement or an apparently liberal left-wing movement. Uh, but I don't think, of course, there's anything intrinsic in, um, say, the liberal left for this kind of, Something has happened where people have got, and why it's happened, but I don't see it as intrinsic. Whereas I do think there's something intrinsic in, say, the neoliberal um, uh, uh, transformation of our world. Okay. But, I mean, that, that, that would be, you know, I, I just don't think, I think it's a kind of deform, a terrible deformation that's occurred. But, um, and I agree it's on both sides, but I don't think it's, it, it, it has the same relation. I don't think it's so symmetrical as you're saying, but. All right, just for time's sake, I'm gonna move on. Um, Steven, you're up. Oh, thank you. Um, you stole my thunder a bit. I had some questions about the last part of the foreign affairs and the foreign language press, but uh, uh, Jack and you and some others have, have uh, handled that beautifully. Uh, you were asking uh, Roger about whether there are any examples of the foreign language press today. I can think of one. Uh, I'm calling from Canada, by the way, but if you take Aboriginal people or in Indigenous people or First Nations people or whatever the term of art is or in the U.S. or Canada, there is a, a language press there. Uh, there's an Aboriginal people's television network as well. And it begs, to me, this all begs the question of what counts as foreign? And I'm wondering what Arendt would say about the preferred media landscapes in the US and Canada, where the left has its uh, favored media, the right has its favored media, and never the twain shall easily meet. So I would be curious to know what you and others think about what Arendt's take on the present media world would uh, look like. What, what do you mean that the left has its favorite media and the right? I'm not sure I understand that. Steve. Well, uh, speaking very crudely, I mean, the, the left would be more or less uh, identified with, with people who uh, read the New York Times, probably watch CNN, and generally stay on the side of, of what some people would call the liberal elite, and the right has its Fox News uh, outlets and th similar things and uh, favored other publications. That's all I mean. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I don't think of that as favorite media types. I mean, yes, they have, you, you see a splitting, an ideological splitting of, of, of the media, yes. Um, that's certainly uh, the case. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think that um, deep desire to only read uh, what one, um, what one agrees with uh, is is uh, is part and parcel of this uh, need, this psychological craving for a kind of certainty and a kind of identity, um, and that to the extent you even encounter oppositional views, it's only through 
people on your ideological spectrum destroying those ideological views. Um, and so you, you never take opposition arguments seriously. What I think is interesting about Arendt's analysis of the foreign language press in the United States in the 1930s and 40s is that what it actually did is at least within the um, European American context. And uh, here I wanna uh, bring uh, Anita, Anita Howarth's comment from the chat in I mean, I think Anita says that um, Arendt's uh, exploration of, of racism is very white in that all of the foreign language press she discusses are European while ignoring the African-American presses. She focuses on the Jewish people in Europe but ignores genocide targeted the Roma. You know, and I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, Arendt is, is, is European and, and she speaks those languages and, and, and that's what she's focused on. And I think that's, that's a, a perfectly good critique. Um, what Arendt is saying is that if you read these press and you look at what they're doing, you see them disagreeing, but also talking to each other and finding a common, uh, a common ground. Um, and I think what you can also say is what they weren't doing is talking to um, African-Americans and black people and, and the black press or um, uh, maybe the Chinese press, and that there wasn't that kind of, and so what you were seeing is the forming of what Arendt calls common interests, but really maybe a common European American interest, not a common American interest. And I think that's a, an important and, and worthwhile critique. Um, to what extent, uh, you know, do we see, uh, what, to what extent are there today other uh, media uh, in which um, people uh, who disagree uh, talk to each other and provide common interests. I certainly don't think Twitter is an answer to that. I, I think Twitter is a, is a platform for, for denunciation and snark. Um, uh, you know, and, and so, and I certainly don't think Fox News or MSNBC or, you know, uh, even CNN is. Um, you know, where is that uh, press? And, and it's increasingly uh, harder to find. So um, I'll take, uh, I take those, those points to be well made. Um, all right, Stephen, questions or response? I, I, I'm not I, sure if I answered all your, your points or not. Close enough, I would say, thank you very much. That's good. Okay, um, I see, uh, there's there's someone who has a question called iPad 29. I don't know who that is, uh, and I don't know if you're still here. But if you are, um, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Roger, that was me. But uh, but I I addressed it earlier. I apologize about that. Oh, it's all right. Yep. Um. So. Uh, Let's see if there's any other, uh, if anyone wants to um, jump in, you, you can. And if there's anything in the, in the chat box, if I'm now trying to read, there's a lot of messages. If anyone has a, 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 sees a question in the chat they'd like me to address, please let me know. I've unmuted you guys, so you can, uh, you can jump in if you'd like. Joyce, you wanna jump in? Just yeah. unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was really impressed with or, or struck by not just the foreign language press, which it, it's kind of a misnomer. When she talks about the Irish, they weren't writing in Gaelic, they were writing in English. <laughs> Even so, um, she was looking at who's, who was funding who is behind these newspapers. She mentions insurance uh, companies which my Irish uh, great aunt sold insurance to other Irish immigrants in Chicago. She was talking about churches and other political organizations. And the reason that article really struck me is I have friends now from Poland and Greece who are starting to sound very reactionary regarding the politics in their home country. 
and uh, they're very uh, one Polish friend who lives in Greenpoint is very involved with many Polish organizations over there, the Girl Scouts, all that stuff. And uh, I was really struck by um, how reactionary she's sounding in regard to the politics in her home country. And so all of these different organizations that are behind the newspapers uh, and they have an interest. And further, isn't it the case that in Serbia, one of the leaders was like originally from Chicago and goes back there and like tries to pursue a very reactionary politics. So anyway, just a couple of comments about the people behind the foreign language uh, media. If anyone. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks, Joyce. I mean, those are those are good points. I mean, RN, you know, is talking about the sort of inconsistencies of the foreign language press in the in this period, where on the one hand they support fascists at home, and yet they're often working class and support FDR, you know, and and, and sort of the New Deal at, at home, um, you know. But I think uh, you're 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 right, um, you know, that that uh, today, uh, you know, as as sort of a kind of pop right wing populism uh, emerges throughout many countries in the world, not just in Europe, uh, you know, you're seeing uh, a kind of uh, uh, um, support for um, the homeland. I mean, you see it in Israel or, or, or as you said, Poland, um, uh, you know, you see it pretty widely. Um, and, and there's a, there's an openness to that. What, what, you know, um, I, I don't know if I have a, a, a full, uh, I mean, why, why, you know, what is, I mean, a lot of these, especially like in, in these cases, you're talking about third and fourth generation uh, Americans um, or second or third generation Americans. What is it that um, leads them uh, to so identify with their country? Um, and I think, you know, one answer could be uh, a, a sense of non, uh, of displacement or the vacuum that we've been talking about uh, here. But I, I haven't thought it all through in that way. I just, uh, I think it's a good point. So thank you. I think, the, I think some other people have, um, have some, have some, I want to contribute to this. So Jack, before I let you in, let me see if either Fran or Daphne want to speak to partic particularly this issue because they, they raised their hands. And then if not, we'll go to, to Jack. Yeah, I just wanted to say that a lot of the newspapers globally, and I read in quite a few, con um, I read the Japanese press and the Israeli press, of course. And I also read Spanish, French, and German. So I do read the local press. Um, I think that one of the problems about ownership of the newspapers has to do with who exactly has the money to own and run some of these newspapers. So you are seeing a progression to the right. You are seeing uh, more conservative elements wanting, obviously, to... Uh, this, is not, this is not comprehensively true, and it's not true in every case, but there is a lot of um, movement towards the right because of the ownership um, of large newspapers um, and small new newspapers not being able to afford to continue to exist and have to sort of merge in with um, larger newspapers. So I think that's one of the arguments for this development today. I, you know, I think I, that may be true, Daphne. I'll just say that, I mean, with the internet, the cost of running an internet publication is, has become quite low. And so it, it does strike me that um, it, it's probably the case that cost can't be the only factor in this. There has to be something else. But, but, uh, even, but even in the internet, you see people um, quoting the New York Times, the Washington Post, the various press, um, you know, the, the, the most progressive newspaper in Israel is Haaretz, but even Haaretz has been struggling to uh, maintain its maybe more centrist, possibly even accused by some of being leftist, positions. 
Um, I think that's true. Um, I, I, you know, if the internet were a more prevalent form, but what do you read on the internet um, for subscribers, they still read the New York Times and they read The Economist and they read The New Yorker on the web. Okay, thanks. Uh, Fran, did you want to add something? It's not related to the uh, foreign press, so should I still ask it? Yeah, go ahead. We have about eight minutes left, so let's, let's hear it. Um, I just wanted to know, um, since we talked about nihilism, uh, what, would, what is the the opposite, actually, or what is the opposite of nihilism? <laughs> well, you know, uh, nihilism uh, for Arendt uh, is, uh, is simply, you know, in its most basic form is uh, the elevation of nothing as the highest value. So um, uh, on, on a philosophical basis, um, uh, the, the opposite of nihilism is, um, uh, some, some belief, uh, whether it's, um, you know, religion or, or nationalism, uh, or, uh, or, or, or a kind of, um, liberalism, uh, that there are certain fundamental values and principles. That's sort of the philosophic nihilism. And so the opposite is simply some highest ideal. I mean, and, and here Nietzsche is your guide. So, you know, at some point you had Plato and there was a belief in super sensible truth. And then you had Christianity and there was a belief in God. And then you had, um, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill and liberalism. And there was a belief in sort of uh, liberalism as, as primary values. And then you had positivism where you had this idea that they were sort of sociological determined norms. And then you get uh, the inversion of that and you believe in the end that there is no truth. But then there's- Can I say something about that from a psychological point of view? Uh, yeah, let me just finish, yeah, sure. uh, finish up and then I'll let you in, Dave, because I just time on short and I'm aware of that. But then what Arendt is really interested in is not philosophical nihilism, but what she calls, um, this sort of experiential nihilism, uh, the experience of feeling adrift and lost, uh, of feeling, um, you know, rootless, lonely, cut off. And so, and she says that this feeling or loneliness is an old idea, but it was usually confined to the elderly, the sick, the pariah, um, and, that the, uh, and that what you've seen happen in mass society is that the actual majority of the population, the masses, have been cut off from interests, cut off from um, fighting for economic or class interests, and they don't actually, their main concerns are not actually improving their lives economically uh, or socially, but um, making themselves feel important. And the easiest way to do that is to join together in a kind of collective fury. Um, so what's the opposite of that? Uh, the main one that Arendt speaks about is interest-based politics, that politics is about the pursuit of interests, not about the pursuit of a kind of craving for psychological, ideological certainty. Um, and when you, are, when you engage in a politics of interests, you do what she talks about in, in these essays. You, you make alliances with people, you make compromises, uh, you ally yourself with people who don't agree with you, but allow you to pursue your interests, uh, which is different from uh, you know, the desire to uh, you know, basically uh, attack your enemies at all costs, even if it's against your own interests. Um, so I guess that, that would be uh, at least the main opposing idea uh, to nihilism. Um, Fran, if you want to respond, and then I'll let David jump in with his, his response. Thank you. That's it. Okay, David? Well, I, I think what you said was very, I suppose the, the, there are different kinds of phenomenologies that we're talking about. So there's a sort of the weary, sad, 
nihilism, which is a sense of despair. But then there's a kind of nihilism, which I would say is a defense against that, which has an excitement about it, which is, I think, one of the things that Arment is referring to. And that kind of exaltation in nothingness has a qualities of mania, really. It has a real manic-driven quality, as opposed to the sad feeling of being lost. So one opposite is a very pathological opposite, which appears to have similarities, but, is, it, but results in a kind, of, a kind of empty exaltation. Another opposite, it seems to me, is the kinds of things that you're referring to, because another opposite would, if you like, they're on one dimension, but in another dimension would be, for example, a kind of sad engagement with the world, a kind of recognition of what is lost, what maybe cannot be found, but a holding on to some, the possibility of goodness and, and a struggle towards it. So a refusal to give up, even in the face of, negative, of such overwhelming negativity. That would be a, a, a psychological opposite, as I would put it. But I think the manic opposite is, is a particular form of uh, individual and group pathology that's yeah. highly destructive. Thanks, David. Those are good points. Just to, 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 put a, to put a point on this, Joyce Mullen asks in the chat, why does nihilism lead to a desire for destruction instead of construction? And I think, I think the answer is similar to what I was just saying, but I think I'll put it in these words. Construction comes through pursuing interests and thus making alliances and compromises with other people you disagree with. Um, nihilism uh, prevents that to the extent that nihilism uh, so fully um, uh, makes us feel alone and adrift and outside of a common interest that we don't pursue those common interests and instead we pursue um, uh, that which makes us feel whole, which would be a kind of fury of destruction. So um, I think that is RN's argument and it's a, it's a profound argument. Um, she's really, I don't know if the only, but one of the first to sort of see this sort of uh, way that nihilism jumps its origins in philosophy and enters into the world uh, in this way. Um, Jack? I, go back for, I just want to go back for a minute to a previous conversation and just for a second, which is, uh, and I'm glad that it was brought up, that uh, one of the things about the uh, foreign language article is, or essay is that she names the, names the uh, publishers of the various publications and talks about how the publications reflect their views. And I just want to say that at that time, at the, once again, in that period, um, newspapers in the U.S. really were um, uh, uh, megaphones for specific publishers. Everybody knew what a Hearst paper was and what a McCormick newspaper was, and, or on the left, what, a, what an Ingersoll newspaper was. And, and, the, uh, and, the all, and newspapers were identified with the publishers themselves and their views, something that in general is not true today. With with uh, ma with one major exception, which I will not mention, uh, uh, the owner of Fox News and other and other uh, publications, but um, but actually uh, uh, even I mean, and then it was uh, even on the left, Dorothy Schiff and her ownership of the of the Post. All of that was when people read those newspapers, they knew that they were listening to the voice of the publisher. Okay, um, I, I, you know. Uh, I think that's fair. Thank you. Um, so look, we're, we're, we're technically uh, done, but I said at the beginning that I'd be happy to uh, respond to any questions if anyone has them about the open letter that was published and that I signed. Uh, I, wrote a, I wrote my own response to it that's on the Hunt Arendt website that you're welcome to look at. It went out in Amor Mundi yesterday. It'll go out again on Sunday. Um, but if anyone wants to... Uh, ask me about why I did it or, or make comments on it. Let's, I'm happy to have a, a short conversation about that. I, I, I realize that there's probably almost no way to have a short conversation about that. But um, if you do wanna chime in or, 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 or ask me 
uh, anything, I'm happy to, to do that. But um, we are uh, technically uh, uh, done for today. Um, I look forward to next week. Next mm -hmm. week, we're going to be reading one of uh, the really well, important. Josh long ago. He one has of the not important, yet appeared. He just oh, shit. called. Really? The important essays in the book, Organized Guilt and Universal Responsibility. So uh, I look forward to that and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Thanks very much. So if anyone uh, would like to, to continue the conversation, I'm happy to do it. If you want to leave, uh, I, I fully understand we all are busy and have things to do. But I'm here for a little bit longer if anyone wants to, uh, to have this conversation. Thanks, Roger. While we're waiting, thank you. Thank you, Roger, for this session. It was terrific, as usual. Thanks again. Thank you, and hey, thank all of you. I mean, I continually amazed, uh, because I, I sort of look at some of these essays and think, these are, these are difficult essays to get something out of. And uh, I give you guys a lot of credit for, for pushing through and, and, uh, and, 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 and making them interesting for all of us, so. Uh, I just came home. Josh hasn't been here yet. Thanks very much, uh, Roger. Uh, I'm away for a few minutes. I don't know whether I'm they're sorry, out. Yeah, I'm sorry, Roger, could you mute some of us? Because we're hearing a lot of everybody. Yeah, well, if I mute you all, then I have to unmute you all. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know who's... If you're talking in the background, maybe you can mute yourself. Um, so, I Roger, I thought I saw in some... Um, uh, somewhere in the chat, somebody asked, what have you received in terms of reaction uh, to the article, to the uh, letter? Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends if you're living in the real world or you're living on Twitter. Um, you know, uh, most of, I mean, I've received a, a few very negative emails, a couple of um, you know, unsavory emails. Um, but uh, most of the emails I've received are, are quite positive and thanking me for, for um, you know, on Twitter, I'd say that there's been a, a, a pretty wide difference. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people attacking the letter, um, uh, but there's also a huge amount of support for the letter. I mean, the fact that it was on the front page of the New York Times, the front that it was on the front page of the national paper in Canada, or one of them, I got some Canadians writing me about it. Um, you know, I've been interviewed, I know the BBC's done stuff on it, Russia's done stuff on it. Um, it's clearly, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, I thought the letter was so anodyne and so simplistic that I worried that it wouldn't make a difference, that, you know, people would ignore it because it was, I just didn't think it said very much. It said, you know, we're against illiberalism and uh, there's a liberalism on the right and there's a liberalism on the left and we're against people being fired because they uh, say things or, or are thought to have said things that people don't like and that's a bad thing. I didn't think it would cause a lot of controversy. Um, the fact that it has, I think, is evidence for maybe why we needed to, to sign it uh, and write it. Um, you know, I think 80 or 90% of the criticisms I've seen of the letter are about who signed it. So, I mean, the fact that JK Rowling signed it has probably been the most controversial uh, aspect of the letter because so many people, especially people on Twitter, are, are so so deeply angry and hateful against J.K. Rowling. Um, and there's this kind of guilt by association that if you sign a letter she signs, you must be guilty. Um, that's been the, the most dominant um, response that I've seen. Um, but, uh, um, you know, there, I'm sure there, there have been some much better and, you know, more subtle and nuanced responses. But, but I haven't gotten a whole lot of, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback and I didn't think I would. I mean, I thought I might um, because again, I thought the letter was pretty, pretty bland um, on purpose. I mean, it's a group letter. I don't think in a group letter you can or should 
uh, you know, speak in specifics because we're not all going to agree. So we made a statement that a lot of people could agree to. And um, as a result, uh, you know, again, from my perspective, the result, the, the reaction has been pretty bland, although I know there are a lot of people angry about it. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, yes, I loved the letter. Um, actually, somebody called me and said, you've got to read this letter. And when I read it and read all the signers, I saw that you signed. And I was so happy you did. I, it, it was nice because um, Mr. Monk, Yasha Monk, had signed it also. And he had just written something in the Atlantic about not firing the innocents. And I was really intrigued by that. And I was so glad people are speaking up. But what's intriguing to me is that these are just sort of lone voices in the wilderness. And I'm hoping that it continues so that we break this trend, which I think is highly dangerous. And I see it in my own personal life right now. Uh, it really kind of frightening. I'm running for school board and I go door to door and I have people when I mention COVID, they point their finger at me and they say, China virus, China virus. And it's, it shocked me and scared me a little bit when I heard that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, look, the world has become highly, highly polarized. Uh, I mean, I, we've been talking about this. Um, I'm glad you liked the letter. Uh, you know, in many ways, the RN Center, you know, my feeling is the RN Center is in its very DNA, and this comes from Hannah Arendt, uh, you know, opposed to the kind of polarization and ideological uh, uh, groupthink that um, we see on both sides right now. The, our conferences are about bringing people who disagree. Our conferences are about trying to bring us out of our comfort zone, make us confront ideas that are uh, difficult. Um, and, you know, we get criticized for it. You know I've been criticized for it. Um, and uh, I'll be criticized for it again. You know, another, another criticism of the letter was, you know, these are people who are, asking, who are whining, saying they're being criticized, yet they have platforms. I didn't see it that way. I mean, to me, none of us were whining. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a very privileged person. Uh, in a lot of ways, and I have the privilege of running the Hannah Arendt Center, which gives me a platform. Um, you know, I get attacked. I've learned to deal with it. Uh, I'm not worried. Uh, I signed the letter because I think more and more people throughout the country are self-censoring themselves. And, um, you know, especially for vulnerable people or people who have uh, ideas that I think might be new, that would be nuanced, they're, um, they're, they're pressured not to express those views because it will cost them their job, maybe their livelihood. And just also, you know, they don't have the kind of uh, institutional support that I have. So I, I signed it as a support for them. You know, I was on an ABC News segment yesterday or two days ago, I guess. Um, and I was on with one of the other signers who writes on Malcolm X. And what he said is he doesn't think Malcolm X could have, written what he wrote if he were writing today um, or someone like Malcolm X, because again, when he wrote it, it was seen as against the orthodoxy, the liberal orthodoxy. And uh, you know, that the kind of group think that we enforce today, um, you know, deprives us of the kind of new and, and revolutionary and, and, uh, and spontane spontaneous uh, new ideas that, that, that we need. Uh, and I thought that was a, a really excellent point. Um, um, I like to, I don't know how you ask a question in this new forum. Hi, it's Ellen. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I, I also see that someone named Chousmans has a hand up. Question raising thing here I'm supposed yeah, to be. But Ellen, go ahead and then I'll call on Chousmans <laughs> after you. Uh, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Thanks for adding good session and all that. Um, I have, I'm very much looking forward to continuing conversation on, on this point. I think the letter was um, much needed. I'm delighted that so, such a wide range of people signed it. I'm constantly fascinated by our absorption with Twitter, 
Um, of course, it's a new medium that we're all yelling and, you know, that there's a lot of yelling and screaming, but I, if, if I think I'm not a brilliant historian by any means, but I think if you go back in history that every era has had its media for yelling and screaming. And um, I'm sort of surprised at the, what I regard as the hypersensitivity of people I would have thought, like ourselves, are accustomed to disagreeing. So I guess my only point is to celebrate that um, I'm part of a group of people that you did take your leadership, you continue to, and hopefully other universities are going to um, continue in their own way, the versions of the Hana Arendt centers. Um, and that somebody, the, the, the voices will reemphasize that this noise is what um, thinking, progressing, um, living in a community of diverse perspectives is all about. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ellen. I mean, I hope so too. And, you know, again, my signing the letter, I, I'm compared to most of the people who signed it, small fish. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope that, I mean, some of the people who signed it are going to take a lot, have taken a lot of heat for it, more so than me, because I'm less known. Um, but uh, I hope that by signing it, we give other people permission to, to be more um, honest with themselves and dare to speak their minds. So I don't think it'll happen right away. I mean, I, you know, that's one of the questions I keep getting asked in these interviews. Will it make a difference? I, you know, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I know that, I'll, I know that a, a counter letter is now circulating and is going to be published soon uh, somewhere. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, I don't know who Chaus oh, Roger. Chaus hey, hey, Roger. Let, me let, let me just let Chausman respond because they had their hand up and then you can fill it, jump in, Scott. Thank you, Roger. It's Carolina. Um, first of all, thank you for signing the letter. Um, I went from using my university subscription to Harper's to subscribing and support. Um, I will be interested to ask you if you could share if you had any comments by students. I teach at university level on this illiberal thing that it's described in um, the letter is happening in the classroom very violently, violently sometimes. Um, and it's terrifying for faculty and I see the self-censoring in me and I see the, the institutional censoring and also the um, fostering of um, the cancel culture by the administration that is terrified uh, of the students, of their parents, and of the press. Can you share a little bit more if you had any comments from your students? You know, a number of former students wrote me. I mean, you know, one thing about my students is I'm not sure most of them are aware of it yet. Um, the students don't read Harper's. Most of my students are not on Twitter. Um, and they certainly don't read the New York Times. Uh, so, you know, I think it will filter down if it filters down at all. I mean, that's the other thing is, you know, even a lot of you weren't even aware of the letter and you get Amor Mundi and you, you know, whatever. I mean, the amount of people who actually are aware that this letter happened seems in our world like a lot, but in the, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you're talking about probably under 1% of the population, if that, you know, maybe 0.5%. And so I think we just have to remember that, you know, things that we think make a big splash are still pretty, um, are, are wildly um, eccentric uh, in the world. Um, you know, so that said, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is an issue that my students are deeply interested in. Um, you know, uh, and I will say it's an issue that the students at the Hannah Arendt Center uh, care a lot about uh, and find really hard. I mean, because people at the RN Center at Bard um, work for, we have, you know, we usually have somewhere between around 10 to 15 student fellows every year. Uh, and on campus, that means we usually have 30 or 40 people who've been closely associated with the center. Um, a lot of them take a lot of heat on campus for being part of the center uh, because, um, uh, you know, we do uh, bring uh, a lot of uh, speakers who are seen by some people to be speakers we shouldn't bring. Um, 
And, you know, I think the students on the one hand are deeply proud to be associated with the center. And yet it's hard for them. They struggle with it because, um, you know, some of them are being canceled. Some of them are under constant threat of being canceled and, um, and they struggle with it. And I, you know, spend a lot of time talking to them about it because, uh, I, I think what they're doing is incredibly brave. Um, it's sad to me that it's come to this, uh, but it's true. Um, by the way, I mean, faculty are maybe worse than students on this. Faculty run away from us faster than students do. And they're more critical of us than students are. Um, uh, which, you know, what I've found over time is that if you can actually talk to students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, they all really love it when we bring these speakers because all oh, 90% of them, because they are actually hungry. They're curious for what other views are. You know, you know, you go back to when you were young, you're, you're, you don't usually embrace orthodoxy. Most of these students are curious, but they're being told by their elders, namely professors that these people are, you know, racist or sexist or transphobic or you know whatever it is and uh, or, or or they are you know in, in other places they are um, liberal and they're woke people and they're radicals and they want to destroy America and they're being told this and, and 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 they're being pressured to be conformist mostly by faculty uh, as far as I can tell and uh, and that's a that's a dangerous situation hey Rock Roger yeah. Hey, uh, so I, I knew about this letter. I didn't know you were one of the one of the signers, and I'm 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 proud that uh, I'm proud that I know you for that. I I, I think it's a good thing. Um, the, the one thing along this cancel culture thing that I find particularly disturbing, and and I see I can see from the faces on the group, everybody's kind of in our generation almost. There's Rob. Rob's definitely young. But do you guys remember? Like I remember, like in the '80s when I just became kind of politically, you know, aware of what was going on in the world, you would hear about in Russia or you would hear about in, you know, North Korea or in China that there would be this political um, uh, leader, but he wasn't the, you know, it wasn't Brezhnev, but it was a subordinate. And he had to get up and give a big public apology about something and it was so Orwellian, you would say like, you know, you could tell it was a contrived apology. You can tell it was, you know, pushed out. And, and it just seems so bizarre that you would have, you know, it just seems so weird. Like you're making, you know, like that's not even a real, I mean, even as a kid, I was like, that's not a real apology. He's just up there to make an apology because he has to make an apology or he's going to end up getting shot. And it just seems so weird. And, you know, the thing that's scarier about cancel culture is people are people, whether it's an athlete or what, whether it's, I think one person who signed this letter um, or whether it's, you know, a, a, a comedian, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they have to get up and they have to like, they give this big apology that's just full of word salad stuff. You know, it's not a, a real apology. They're just trying to save their butts. And number one, they shouldn't have to apologize anyways. And so, like, the thing is, this whole apology thing is what is scary to me because it's definitely, you know, a power thing. It's definitely, you know, if, if you know, if, if a whole bunch of people, you know, let's say at your school, uh, let's say at a, at, a, at, a, at a phantom school, you know, if, if, you know, you, you know, if somebody at that phantom school who was in your position signed that letter and then all of a sudden there's a million tweets from that school's students, you know, you know, then, you know, do, you know, does that person have to get up and, you know, make this huge apology, uh, you know, in front of cameras or, or whatnot, just to save their job. And, or, you know, like what happened at Evergreen with like Brett, uh, Brett Weinstein, um, you know, I mean, that, to me, that's just crazy scary. And, and, and to me, like, you know, uh, I personally don't think any shot. Scott, I Scott, I agree with you, but so let me ask you a question, just because I, I, I know I know we agree on some and disagree on some on this. Sure. Let me ask you a question. It seems to me that one of the differences between cancel culture on the right and the left right now is that on the left, if you're canceled, you can try and make an apology 
sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? You know, you can apologize and sometimes you're, you're uncanceled. And sometimes, you know, if you're like one of the Me Too offenders or other bigger offenders, you're not. But on the right, you know, if you're Jeff Sessions or if you're Vinman or you're someone who gets canceled by Trump on, on the right, there seems to be no, there seems to be no avenue back. Um, and I'm wondering yeah. if that's the difference and what the, and, and, and what, and why, why is it that, you know, you know, and part of it is that the people who get canceled often by Trump are more powerful people. So maybe they have other avenues. I don't know, but I, I, I think that's, yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a big part of it is just in terms of the powers. It's like, you know, Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions doesn't have to worry about going home to his district and, 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 you know, and his constituency hating his guts, you know, they may not, they may not, they may not, uh, 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 you know, the, you know, if it's, if it's a crazy Trump supporter, you know, they may, they may say something to him, but you know, I don't think he has to worry about him and his family going to a restaurant and then a bunch of Trump supporters throwing food at him or anything. Um, uh, no, I don't, I disagree with that. I mean, what about, what about uh, Alexander Vindman? I mean, he's being, you know, he's been, he's been, he needs security. I mean, and he's not the only one. A lot of the people who have, uh, who Trump has canceled, you know, have to pay for private security and are in danger of being, uh, you know. Well, yeah, well, if, if, if I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm not familiar with that. If that's the case, then that's, then, yeah, I, I have, there's no, ju- I mean, yeah, I have no, ju- I think the thing that's scary, to me, the thing that's a little bit more scarier on the left, uh, and, and once again, I'm coming from a biased point of view, is that it's with the youth and with the, with the young you know, young kids who are going to be our next generation of, of leaders. And, and I think that in the defense of Trump at all, I'm just saying just in terms of, you know, I had, oh, this is before COVID at Christmas, I, one of my good fraternity brothers, his, his daughter, uh, she's recent graduate and, and works at a university and her boyfriend works at a university. And they're very left wing, which doesn't bother me at all. I mean, he, my, my best friend is, is left wing, but the thing that was different about my friend and them was we got in this debate and, you know, their thing was like the primary goal of the government is to keep us safe and to protect us. That's the primary goal, you know, and, and, and like anything that you would say, like they were all bent out of shape because my friend and I were watching a Chris Rock, <laughs> a Chris Rock video, uh, co- co- comedian, you know, and, and, you know, we feel unsafe. It's like, you're 24 years old. What do you mean you feel unsafe? Chris Rock, you feel unsafe? You know, I mean, it's it just, I know I'm digressing there, but I guess my thing is, is just a little bit with the the youth of it. And, um, uh, but yeah, I have no, if, if, if people Trump is fired, needs to grab security, uh, then that, 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 I, I, I have no excuse for that. It's, you know, that's a problem. That's yeah. a problem. No, I, you know, I appreciate that. I mean, I, you know, but just, uh, I'm sorry, not to interrupt, but I guess my big point is, and I, and maybe I don't know what everybody else thinks about it was, I believe that there are times you should apologize to somebody, but you should apologize some, to somebody when you feel you've done that person wrong or the group wrong. And if it's a person, it should be in private or in private first. And then let that person say, hey, they came to me in private and I, I respect them for apologizing. But this parading of people around, it's a parading. I mean, no one who gets up and apologizes really means it because they, it's, it's like if J.K. Rowling's got up right now and was felt like she was compelled to apologize. Come on. She didn't change her mind and just because, you know, in, in one day, you know, you know, she's just apologizing because she feels compelled to. And that's the, the, the no, I, look, Scott, I, I hundred percent agree with you. I don't, that's why I don't believe in group letters of assassination or, or, or mobbing. Right. But uh, I mean, all I would say is that, you know, to the extent that for some reason, the critique of cancel culture has largely become seen to be a critique of the left. I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think, you know, you see more of it right now and maybe more substantial aspects of it on the right. And, and that's what well, part of my contribution to this letter was, you know, when it was originally written, it had words like the left or in it. And I said, you know, I think you got to take that out. I think it's a, I think you're seeing a huge cancel culture emerge uh, on the right. 
um, starting with the president. Um, and, uh, and I think that's deeply dangerous. Um, and but so how do you, um, and, 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 and no, I, and I want to hear your, and I, I want to hear your take on this, but how do you separate like cancel culture with Trump from him firing somebody? I mean, you have a right to fire. I mean, to me, you have a right to fire somebody, even if you don't, you know, I've been fired before unjustly, but you know, it was the place's right to fire me, you know? Um, um, uh, but I mean, I, I, I guess that maybe I'm, maybe I'm not as informed and, and I'm, I'm willing to be informed, but maybe I'm just not informed what it is other than you're fired. You know, I mean, um, well, I think it's a difference between, I mean, yeah, you, you have a right to fire someone, but if you're, you know, I mean, if you fire someone because, and, and, and call them evil and call them stupid and, and, and yeah. you attack them and yeah. you assassinate their character, yeah. you're basically, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you're basically, you're not, you're not firing them because of something they did wrong. You're yeah. firing yeah. them because you, they, they, they did or said something that you yeah. think, you know, yeah. uh, you know, crosses a line of, of your team yeah. and, you know, by the loyalty yeah. of them. And that's yeah. unfortunately how Trump yeah. lives. Yeah. The, the, the one thing, and, and once again, I'm, like I've said, uh, it, uh, I, I'm trying, I, I'm not, I'm honestly not trying to defend Trump here per se, but it, it, it seems to me that Trump is brutal with his message, but it seems like, to me, it's like him punching back versus him taking it first, it, then him punching first. To me, he, to me, he, he is the type of person who, you know, you know, just, you know, if, if somebody says anything and, and I'm not justifying this, but it seems to me he punches back versus it being the other way around. I mean, um, you know, again, I, 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 we, then we get into the who, you know, who started it, you know, which I yeah, tell yeah. is not the right way to go. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when they go low, we go high is, is, is something that yeah. neither side is practicing. Yeah. Uh, the fact that the president it, yeah. of the United States what, goes low we, 15 times a day is to me yeah. uh, an embarrassment. Yeah. I, let me let me just bring in yeah, some I, other people because yeah. just one real quick thing and yeah. then I'll let it go. I uh, but I'm sorry. I, I I I think the great thing though, and it's what I like about the Hannah Rent Center is that we're here talking. I mean, you know, I mean, everyone here may totally disagree with me, and that's great. But the thing is, is I've learned something from everyone here, and. Maybe you learn just a little bit. I don't know. But I'm just saying, this is what I think our generations, I mean, Rob's younger than us, but this is what it was all about. And that's the scary thing to me is that we don't seem to be able to talk like this anymore. And I'll leave it at that. I appreciate it. And I think it's great that you're here. And uh, I love the fact that we talk to people uh, who disagree with us at the center. That's what we do. Uh, Rob, you're, that's an introduction for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to make a quick comment that the, the thing that at least sticks most out to me um, about the difference between like firing someone versus canceling someone is that it seems that something new has been brought into the world to put it in errant words. And for me, I think it's the, the term virality. I mean, I, I know it's, it was used a while ago, but it's still kind of relevant today, but in the context of denying someone with virality, I think it's something that is new that hasn't really ever been, um, introduced into the world. And so there's, it, it seems that vir virality to me adds a new force or a new power to certain actions that is seemingly being destructive right now. Um, that, yeah, that's just the, the kind of idea yeah, that came to I mean, my I, mind. I think, I think the viral nature of this stuff is extraordinary, especially because, you know, most people who retweet things or whatever have no idea what they're talking about you know no 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 understanding i mean they often people retweet things before they even read the link um uh and then when you call them on it they say oh i didn't read it <laughs> um but uh, you know look there's always been rumors and there's always been vi virality just in different ways but there's no doubt um that today um the, I think a big difference is that today uh, you can really um, uh, it's very easy to get caught up in a viral echo chamber in which you never hear an opposing point of view. Um, uh, I, 
you know, I just, I don't want to say there were good old days because trust me, there were, you know, plenty of times in which fascism and, and groupthink emerged. But, you know, you know, I just look back to when, you know, I grew up, New York City was a much more diverse place culturally, r racially, um, uh, by what people did. I mean, now, at least in Manhattan, you know, you can't afford to live there unless you're, you know, pretty wealthy. Uh, and, you know, people, you just don't encounter, I mean, this was actually Charles Murray's argument in his book, Coming Apart, but he's not the only one to make it. You don't encounter people who disagree with you on a daily basis. People are living in communities that are either really rich or really poor. They're working in places where they don't encounter people that disagree with them. You know, Facebook and Google are kicking out employees who disagree with them. The Koch brothers on the other side are kicking out employees who disagree with them. You're, you're just creating, um, you know, these kind of echo chambers so that it's not only a virality, it's a virality in which you just never encounter any friction. And um, that to me is a, a real problem. Okay, I mean, unless well, there's any- <laughs> Just one thing really quick, I know you're, I really appreciate you staying on. What you just brought up there is just a perfect idea of how important the Hannah Rent Center is and also the negative offense of cancel culture because you bring up Charles Murray um, you know, he is excoriated primarily from the left because of the bell curve, which he wrote in 1985 or 1990. And let's just say, theoretically, you thought that was an awful book. It was poor scholarship. It was insensitive and whatnot. By canceling him, you're not going to read the book that you just talked about, which is an excellent book. And you're just going to say, like, that book has no worth because we canceled him 30 years ago, you know, and, and, and that's why you can learn something from everybody, I think. I think we'll end it with that because I couldn't agree more and I appreciate uh, that you guys uh, are committed to what we're trying to do. So thank you all very much. Um, look forward to seeing you next week.